Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. Well, if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra and Ezra and chapter number 9. The book of Ezra and Ezra and chapter number 9. We are now in our last couple of messages in the book of Ezra. This has been a wonderful book because it has been a book to prepare us for revival. In the book of Ezra, we've learned several different principles that we learn that God works through a remnant. He doesn't work through the masses and he has never expected it. He's always working through a remnant and that it just needs to be a few people to get thoroughly right with God and God could do a tremendous work. That we see other principles of drawing nigh unto God, looking unto him, being prepared to receive what God would have for us. These are some of the principles that we have learned. And now we come up to Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9. Now in Ezra chapter 9, we're going to see a prayer that Ezra prays. We're going to study that prayer in detail next week. But you should get to know some of the great prayers of the Bible. In fact, there are many prayers of the Bible that you can pray yourself. And it's not a violation of scripture to actually take your Bible and to pray these prayers out loud to God and make them yours. Ezra chapter 9 has always been one of my prayers of revival. As we said before, Ezra is preparing us for revival. Ezra chapter 9 is a great prayer of revival. And it's not one where, hey God, we're so great, you need to pour your blessings upon us. That's a misunderstanding of what revival is. Ezra chapter 9 is, we have failed you so badly and we don't deserve anything and we need your grace. Now, before we can study Ezra chapter 9, we need to see the events that prompt that prayer. What is going on? What happened that caused Ezra as he has come and they've restored worship and they're going to be uh, having church services? We're going to see it in Nehemiah chapter 8 where Ezra's leading great church services and everyone's gathered and everyone's responding. Uh, What happens to this time? Well, we're going to see that sin got involved. And we're going to see that there's some violations of biblical principles. And Ezra realizes how bad they messed up. If you don't mind, let's look at Ezra chapter 9 and just see the context before we actually study the prayer. Ezra chapter 9 and verse 1. Ezra chapter 9 and verse 1. Notice this. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Egyptians and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed hath mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and the rulers have been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and I sat down astoned. And then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astoned unto the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose up from my heaviness and having my rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. And I said, O my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for in our iniquities are increased over our own head and our trespass is grown up into heaven. If you don't mind, we're going to see this big issue that we have. Notice with me in Ezra chapter 9 and verse 1. Ezra chapter 9 and verse 1, and you have it of marking things. Notice what this big sin was. Notice what broke Ezra's heart. Notice what needed to be fixed and repented of. Ezra chapter 9 and verse 1. Notice with me this phrase, have not separated themselves. 
have not separated themselves. With this, we're going to see as Rezi prays this prayer to help separate ourselves unto the Lord. That the failure was is that they failed to separate themselves. Now, with this, let's kind of run through the history so that way we can see how awful this is. If we don't explain it, some people may not have an understanding of why is this a big deal. Well, understand that at the very beginning that God set himself to have a people unto himself. And he called unto him Abraham from the land of Ur to separate himself from the world from Ur, which was worshiping other gods. In fact, God specifically said, separate yourself from your family, that Abraham's father, Terah, was actually worshiping a false god, a moon god named Sin. And so he said, separate yourself. It wasn't until Terah died that God said, all right, now I can put my blessings because now you could finally be obedient to me and separated himself further from everyone so he could separate him from the world unto God. God worked with Abraham and Abraham became the friend of God. God allowed Abraham to have a son of promise, a miraculous birth of Isaac, and that carried through the promise. Through that we had, um, Isaac had a son by the name of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. These 12 sons were going to be the 12 tribes of Israel. They were brought into Egypt and Egypt, they were forcibly separated How do you mean? Well, the Egyptians understand that these Hebrew people were not part of them. And so they were isolated. They were persecuted. They were made slaves. They were told that there was a lot of things that really isolated the Jewish people from the Egyptian culture. They were exposed to the Egyptian culture, but they're isolated. So God pulled them out of the... uh, out from Egypt, which is a picture of the world in the Bible, and as a picture, pulled them out of the world and separated the mass of people unto himself with the idea that he wanted to be their God. And through the wilderness wanderings, he proved himself over and over by miracles that he was a God for them and that they needed to be drawn to them. And that was how it was planned to be. However, separation is always an issue. We had a prophet by the name of Balaam who was hired by a king of Moab by the name of Balak to curse the people. And you remember the story that Balaam was hired. He, God tried to get a hold of him several times not to do it, but he went anyways. God really put a fear of God into him to said, you better not say anything that I don't tell you to say. Yes, sir. And every time he went to go bless the people, I curse, you know, every time he was meant to curse the people, he ended up blessing the people. Balak said, I'm hiring you to curse the people, but you keep blessing them. What are you doing? And he finally says, I can't curse what God has already blessed. However, if I teach you how to work with the people, the uh, Hebrew people, you can get God to curse them yourself. Tell me more. What you need to do is take your Moabite ladies Bring them, introduce them. Say we want to be friends and allow the Hebrew people to intermarry with the Moabite ladies. How's this going to work? Well, the Moabite ladies are going to bring in their false gods and their false worship. And instead of the Hebrew people being drawn unto God, they're going to be distracted because of these ladies to go look at other gods. There's always an influence of a wife and a girlfriend to whether they're going to get closer to the Lord or further away from the Lord. And so they ended up serving and looking at these other Moabite gods and God cursed his people Israel because they lost their separation. And this is going to be the big theme all throughout the rest of biblical history. God is trying to draw a people to himself. But they refused to separate themselves unto the Lord and from the world. And they continued to go worship other gods. Because of that, you have the period of judges where you have a cycle of over and over and over where they have rest. When they have rest, they don't look at God. They look at the other gods. What happens is that God puts them in sight of a persecution. They Uh, pray and beg for God to save them. God sends a deliverer. After they get delivered, they they get their eyes off the Lord and they have a time of peace and and they start worshiping other gods and over and over it goes. All throughout 
the rest of Hebrew history, you find the same thing that over and over Solomon, who twice spoke with God personally, married other women. These other women introduced him to these false gods and he began to worship these other false gods, which started to bring the judgment of God upon the nation. Because of this, his son Rehoboam also was not wise. And because of that, the kingdom was divided into two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom attempted to try to remain true to God. The northern kingdom gave up immediately. They started to say, the God who brought you out of Egypt was these golden calves that we have at these two locations. You don't have to go to Jerusalem anymore. Just worship the golden calf. By the way, is the golden calf God? No. Was God happy with the worship of him even though it was in his name? No. no. So false worship was also a lack of separation. They're now not worshiping God. They're not separated unto the Lord and from the world. And so the northern kingdom just totally went away with God until they stopped pretending with Jezebel. Jezebel, they just openly started worshiping false gods. Yay. The southern kingdom had some good kings that tried to come back, but then you'd have other kings that go, hey, I like that God. I like that God. You have Ahaz. Hopefully that's the right king. (laughs) Ahaz. No, no, Asa was a good king. Ahaz, he actually went to his enemy's capital and said, hey, look at that. They have a good idol to a false god there. Hmm, they keep winning wars. Maybe it's because of that idol. I know I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to build that same idol. And so you had over and over until finally God had enough that the people were not going to separate themselves to God. Jeremiah's preaching for 40 years. Keep looking at God. Keep looking at God. They're like, we're fine. Keep looking at God or he's going to send judgment. We're fine. So much so that Jeremiah twice, Jeremiah chapter 6 and Jeremiah chapter 8, he says this, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Nay, they were not ashamed, neither could they blush. That word blush carries the idea it is a facial response, a bodily reaction to something shocking, to something appalling, to something embarrassing, to something that you know is not right. And so Jeremiah said, because they're so far away of God, they haven't lost their separation. They've also lost their blush. Interesting. So because of that, God sent the Babylonian empire to come and conquer the Jerusalem. Now, God gave them warning. He had Jeremiah, but he also had Habakkuk. Habakkuk looked at his... uh, kingdom of Jerusalem and and Judea. And Habakkuk the prophet said, hey, look at everything that's wrong. Look, our judges aren't doing right. There's so many people doing wrong that our judges no longer rule that's right. Sounds familiar. There's violence everywhere. There's corruption everywhere. God, what are you going to do about this? And he was surprised when God answered him. And he said, ye among the heathen. He says, I'm going to do a work in your day that if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. He says, all right, what are you going to do? Ye among the heathen. I'm going to send the Babylonians to come and conquer you. And he says, they're worse than us. How was that going to work? God said, I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Habakkuk's like, how are we going to solve our problem that we're worshiping these false gods? I am going to send you to a place where they worship more gods than what you do. How's that going to work out? But God did it for purpose because God knows what we need And he did it to bring a people back to himself to worship the one true God. Now, after 70 years, they're prepared. Zerubbabel leads a return. And those that want to follow God come with him back to Jerusalem with the idea that they're going to be separated unto God. Ezra comes back with a second return to bring a people who wanted to serve God to come back and bring them back for them to be separated from the world unto the Lord. So now they've got two groups of people that have brought together Hebrew people that have come from Babylon under Zerubbabel, under Ezra, both of them with both groups put together with the idea we want to be separated unto God. So great, we're now separated unto God. That's what God wants. Then Ezra Here's this report. Guess what, Ezra? They're starting to marry the heathens around. And as they're starting to marry the heathens around, 
they're already starting to worship other gods. We just did this. God just spanked us for this. By the way, that's what Ezra's prayer is all about. He's like, God, we messed up and we messed up again. You just spanked us and we came back. We have no, no excuse. We messed up. But the, the problem was, is their lack of separation. By the way, what is our number one problem? Our lack of separation. Amen. That we're not separate from the world unto the Lord. You said, but we don't worship other gods. Yeah, you do. The God of PlayStation, Xbox, Uh television, YouTube, Facebook. How do you know it's a God? Well, quite simply, whatever gives you orders and you immediately obey. My video game's calling me. I got to go play. Facebook is calling me. I got to see what's on my feed next. Oh, I got to see what the YouTube videos are. Look through. Oh, there are people that cannot stay away from their screen now. That you can almost see them starting to get into sweats if they haven't checked their Facebook feed in a while. They just, I got to, I'm just craving. Well, there's other gods out there. Hobbies. Addictions. We've lost our separation and we worship other gods. Our problem is same here. Our lack of separation. Let's study a little bit about what the Bible says about separation as we learn from here and learn how to be separate from God and how important this is and the results of being separate from God. First thing I want to show you is separation begins with prayer. Separation begins with prayer. Jesus prayed for the disciples and specifically how Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer. Remember, John 17 is actual Jesus's prayer to God. And in Jesus's prayer to God, Jesus is praying that the disciples and those that follow, which would include us, that they have to live in the world, but they would not be of the world. Does that make sense? We have to live here, but we don't have to act like them. The idea is that we're to be separate. There should be a distinction. There should be a difference that we should not be like them. Paul himself (laughs) explains in Romans chapter 1 some of the blessings that come from separation. Notice with me in Romans 1. And let's just look through some of these things. We're coming back to Ezra eventually. But Romans chapter 1. In the first chapter of Romans, we find few of the blessings that flow from separation of the faith life. That is, we separate ourselves from the world and unto the Lord and plug ourselves into him. We know that there's some things that happen as we are separate. Now, by the way, if these things are not in your life, it is probably because you are not separate. The world distracts us from looking at God. The world distracts us from looking at God clearly. These false gods that we have in our life distract us. Notice with me, there's a couple things that we find. Verse number one, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. We know that first of all, there's a desire to know God's word. Paul says, I'm called unto him. I'm separated unto the gospel of God. When you are separated from the world, you have a desire to know God's, to know God's word more. If you don't have a desire to know God's word more, it is more than likely because you're not separated unto the Lord. You are distracted. Facebook, YouTube, whatever else. This is a big deal. A very big deal. Notice as we go on verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among the nations for his name. Here in verse 5, we could see that there's a desire to obey the Lord and please him. For we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among the nations. Why? For his name. That when you are separated unto the Lord from the world, there's a desire to be obedient to him. If you don't want to be obedient to him, it's more than likely you are not separated from the world unto the Lord. That you have these little G gods in your life that you would rather spend time with, that you would rather serve more with. Notice with me in verse 8. 
For I thank my God, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the entire world. He's saying, listen, the whole world's heard of your faith. When we're separated unto the Lord from the world, that God increases our faith and we want to reach the world. We do want to reach the world. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse 26. For this cause, God gave them... I'm oh, sorry, verse number 9 is where I was going for. I'm so sorry. Uh, Romans 1, 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Notice this. He says, without ceasing I make mention of you. What happens is that when you're plugged in unto the Lord, you want to pray more. You want to talk to God more. You ever think about Paul's prayer life? And he tells all these people, I'm praying for you all the time. You know how much time that takes? It's not a lot of time to play PlayStation. Not a lot of time to do other stuff. He's, he's serving God and taking the time that he has to pray because he realizes how much prayer is. The more that you believe in prayer, the more you want to pray. Amen. The reason why we don't pray more is because we don't believe how much prayer works. When you're plugged into God and you say, look at what God do, is doing in answering prayers, it draws us closer. Notice with me in verse number 11 and 12. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith of both uh, you and me. Notice verse 14 and 15. For I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. What happens is that when we're plugged into God, separated from the world and unto him, we start to recognize faith and discern spiritualness in others. And we want the others to blossom and to grow. Amen. That we're concerned more with others and their spiritual walk. Again, when we get selfish, it's usually because we're not plugged into God the way that we should. So we can see that there's some benefits, but it begins with prayer. That is, we're praying and we're talking with God. Something else that we understand, and this is key, separation reveals God. Separation reveals God. One of the greatest pictures of separation is found in Exodus 33. Turn with me. To be able to have a biblical idea of how biblical separation really works, Exodus 33. Exodus 33, Moses is now at the zenith, the height, the peak of his ministry. And at the height, the zenith, and the peak of his ministry, he has one prayer request. Let's see what it says. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in Exodus 33. And let's begin... At verse number 12. Exodus 33 verse 12. And Moses said unto the Lord. See thou sayest unto me. Bring up this people. And thou hast not let me know. Whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said I know thee by name. And thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee. If I have found grace in thy sight. Show me now thy way. That I may know thee and that I may find grace in thy sight consider that this, this nation my people now notice this in verse 14 and he said my presence this is God my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest and he said unto him if thy presence go not with me carry us not up thence so Moses is now saying if you're not going with me I'm not going I want you to be with me I want your presence I want to be with you notice verse 16 for wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? Notice this. So shall we be separated. You know the most biblical verse on biblical separation is right here. That when we have God's presence, we will be separated. Amen. There is a type of tree in the world that it's the last tree to lose its leaves. It loses its leaves not in the fall but in the springtime. And what happens is the brand new growth of the new leaves come out. It pushes out the old leaves and makes them fall to the ground. That's exactly what God does with us. 
that as we're plugged into him and separated unto him, he pushes out those old things. Things are different now. Something happened to me when I gave my life to Jesus. Things I loved before have passed away. Things I love far more have come to stay. Things are different now. Something happened to me when I came to meet Jesus. When you come and plug yourself up to Jesus, what happens is that he naturally pushes out those old things. Things that you used to love before you were saved, you don't want to do them no more. Things you used to listen to before, you don't want to listen to them anymore. God's presence separates us naturally from the world. So many times people, Christians, have the idea that, that well, I've got to live like a Spartan and I've got to get rid of this and I've got to get rid of this and I've got to get rid of this and then I've just got to live like a monk. What happens is that God just changes us so we just no longer desire the things of the world. And the more that we're plugged into God, the more we're going to be separated out. This is the most biblical verse explaining biblical separation. Plug yourselves into God. By the way, this is why we say all the time, the greatest thing you could do on a daily basis is to read the word of God for yourself. Preacher, how come I'm not changing? Because you're not in your Bible. <laughs> if you desire him and want him, you will be changing. One of the wonderful things about the core group of this church is an evidence of a changed life. That people who've been here for a while have been listening. They could say, listen, this is what I used to be and this is what I am. And it wasn't because the pastor made me or it wasn't because of some rules and regulation. God just naturally changed me. I look back, I didn't even realize that I changed this. Amen. I didn't even realize I think differently. I didn't even realize I respond differently. I'm just following after God and God automatically changed me. Amen. Remember that separation is not the goal. It's a byproduct. God is the goal. And as we plug into God, he changes us. You see, this is why the big problem was with the false gods. That they were going to drag them away from God. Now, they had a responsibility not to start down that path. To separate themselves from the world and unto the Lord. And as they plug themselves into the Lord, he draws closer to us. And pushes those other things out. This is the idea Separation reveals God to get to know him more. Let me show you something else that Jesus said in the New Testament. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. One of the most comforting verses in all of scripture. You may not know the address, but you've at least heard the passage referred to before. Matthew 11. And let's see what Jesus has to say concerning this subject. Matthew 11, notice with me in verse number 28. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come unto me. All right, so Jesus is speaking. Come unto me. Who? All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Where do we get our rest from? Jesus. Plugging into Jesus. Separating ourselves from the world unto him, and he gives us rest. Now notice verse 29. Take my yoke upon you. By the way, that word yoke carries the idea of work. Hey, I thought he said to give me rest. Well, you have a wrong definition of rest. The rest comes from when we plug ourselves into the Lord. It doesn't mean an absence of work. In fact, it means that you're going to work more. But what happens? I don't want to work more. Well, notice what happens when you plug yourselves into Jesus and you work more. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You know where you learn of Jesus in? By separating yourselves and working with him. What is a yoke? A yoke is something that you would harness up animals. So let's say that we had two oxen. You put two oxen. They're now separated from everyone else and plugged into each other. Now they have to work together. That's important. They learn so much about them. And if we're plugged into Jesus, we're harnessed up to him. We're yoked up to him. We learn more about him as we're laboring and working. By the way, it is not an unrestful thing. It becomes a very restful thing because we get our strength from him. With the idea of having an oxen yoked up, what happens is that Jesus does all the work and we're along for the ride. Well, that makes it easier for us because we're not laboring and pushing. He's doing all the work. We're just with him learning. 
when you learn to separate yourselves from the world and unto him and let him do all the work, you know, we know that in ministry there's a, a saying of burnout. Burnout, burnout, the uh, biblical phrase is actually weary and well-doing. The Bible says, be not weary and well-doing. Well, how do I not weary and well-doing? When I'm resting in him. Resting in him. When we're not resting in him, we could work really hard doing good things and wear ourselves out. We can avoid that worldly term of burnout or weary and well-doing when we rest in him and let him do the work. Notice what he said again. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls while you're yoked up. Amen. Not an absence of work, but being able to trust him to do all the work, that when I am weak, he is strong. He can do the work. He's just using me, and I'm just enjoying the journey, learning of him. Notice what he says. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because he's doing all the work. We're just learning of him and we're resting in him. When we are separated from the world, we find that we learn more about God. We're plugged into him. And he changes us as we learn more about him. This is why separation is so important. We're not saying that we're some crazy Baptist cult that says, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this the can plug into him and it's all worth it Amen. you're not missing out on anything if you're plugged into the Amen. lord Amen. and you're gaining so much learning of him to let the world go to plug into him and find a life worth living plugging into him in fact notice with me we galatians chapter 6 the Bible has quite a bit to say on this subject. And if God mentions it quite a bit, then we need to pay attention to it. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Galatians six fourteen. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I into the world. He says... I want to get to the place where my Jesus is my satisfaction. That's all I want to glory about. And the world is behind me. I don't have to worry about the things of the world anymore. That um, <laughs> the world is crucified unto me. That world, the word crucified carries the idea it's dead to me. The world's dead to me. And, <laughs> and the world, um, and I to the world, I'm all satisfied with Jesus. I just want to glory in him. Praise the Lord. Now, with this, we also see that separation is required. Separation is required. Before we could separate ourselves to the Lord, uh, uh, before we could serve God, we have to separate ourselves from the world. Look with me, if you don't mind, in the book of Ezra. Ezekiel, 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 Ezekiel. The other E one, Ezekiel. Good. I want to show you two passages. Ezekiel 44 to start off with. Ezekiel 44. Notice what preachers should be teaching. Ezekiel 44. Notice with me verse 23. Ezekiel 44 and verse 23. Ezekiel 44, 23. And it says, And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane and cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean. Here it's saying what preachers should preach. What a preacher should preach? We should preach the difference between the holy and profane. Unfortunately, for Ezekiel's time, they did not teach the difference. Just let me read this for you. Ezekiel twenty two twenty six says, Her priests have violated my laws and have profaned my holy things. And they put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the clean and the unclean. And have hid their eyes from my Sabbath and I am profaned among them. That the requirements is that as a preacher, I'm supposed to teach you to be separated from the Lord 
from the world unto the Lord. Teach you to show that there's a difference between the holy and the profane. There should be a difference. However, judgment came upon Jerusalem and Judea because they showed no difference. There was no separation out. Separation is a requirement to be served of God. God wants us to serve with clean hands. Let's give an example. Let's say that we have a great pianist. On Saturdays, they play at the local country honky-tonk bar and they're playing all this music. And then on Sunday, could they really be used of God in his spirit to play piano for congregational? No. No. They may play the notes right, but there's not going to be God's spirit upon it and it's not going to have God's blessing. Because they're not separated out. To be separated for God's use and God's use alone. We see that separation is required. But we also see that separation is rewarded. Separation is rewarded. There's another couple passages that deal with separation. Notice with me 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is the classic passage dealing with the idea of separation. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Notice with me in verse 11. Second Corinthians 6. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is opened unto you, and our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but are straightened in your own bowels. Now for our recompense the same. I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Be not un- unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And with what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believed with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate saith the Lord and I will not touch the unclean thing and I will receive you there's a blessing that comes with separation it's our communion with God God promised he would receive us he promised that we could fellowship he could be with us when we're separated and clean unto him now I told you to get back to Ezra and I want to keep my word Ezra chapter 9 Now, if you remember, there were two words that was used in Jeremiah that said, as a result of the people uh, not being plugged into the Lord, that it says that they had lost their blush. blush. Oh, blush. Sorry. The word blush is only used three times in Scripture. Two in Jeremiah, chapter 6 and chapter 8. The third time is in chapter number Uh, Ezra chapter number 9. Notice if you don't mind, and I want to show you this. Ezra chapter number 9. And we're going to get into the prayer next week. But I want you to see this word used once again. Notice with me in verse number 8. Ezra chapter 9 and verse uh, verse number 6 is where I was going, where we had read before. Ezra chapter 9 verse 6. And I said, oh my God, I am ashamed. And next word blush to lift up my face in thee my God for our iniquities have increased over our head and our trespasses grown up to the heavens you know having a blush is a good thing having a blush means that we're still ashamed of some of the things that we do which is in our world there's a lot of people who's not ashamed we get to the place where you said hey have you read your bible and they're not ashamed that's not shouldn't be true for a Christian Hey, you missed church the other day. Eh, not ashamed. I was doing something. No problem. It's a big deal. Hey, you haven't been doing anything for the Lord lately. Eh, it's all right. I've got other things to do. You say those are little things. I know, but they're big to the Lord. When we've lost our blush. I meant we live in a world that's so completely lost their blush that, you know, they brag. Oh, man, this weekend I got totally wasted and I just threw up all over the place and I can't wait to do it again. They're not ashamed of their sin. 
They're not ashamed of things. That are, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Nay, they were not ashamed. There's a lot more worse sins. I'm just saying there should be basic things that we should be ashamed of. Have you been reading your Bible? No, no, I haven't. We should be ashamed of that. We should have a blush for it. And the fact that people don't shows that there's something bad wrong. You know, the closer you get with the Lord, the more sensitive we are on our sins. Amen. And even small sins like lying or maybe not telling the whole truth should convict us. That's one of the things about being plugged into the Lord. And if we're convicted over small sins, hopefully the big sins have been taken care of. We need to get back to being close with the Lord. Ezra is going to pray and we're going to study this great prayer next week. The prayer of revival. And see that it's not, oh Lord, bring down your spirit. It's the spirit of revival is, we are so messed up. We've messed up so badly. We don't deserve your grace. But you're such a good God and we need you. Getting back to dependence upon the Lord. Following after him. This idea of separating, that we separate ourselves from the world and unto the Lord. It's not something to be ashamed of or afraid of. People of the world make fun of that and say that we're, we're just controlling lives. It's not it at all. We're trying to show you the best life that this world cannot offer you one bit. The best life is plugging into the Lord and learning of him and seeing that, man, why, why would I go back to that stuff after I've seen the Lord? Amen. The Bible says in Psalms, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. The idea of taste and see is the idea of experience it for yourself. You try it for yourself. And once you plug into the Lord and see his blessings, why would you ever want to go back? There's nothing on television that could equip and equate to the presence of God. There's nothing that the world can offer, no concert, no movie that can give you the thrill of watching God work in your life. But we have to be separated from the world unto the Lord. Be ye separate. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.